Firstly, I would like to thank Professor Varun, who has been kind enough to take out some time from his busy schedule and has agreed to give a talk in the QE Club tonight. Thank you, sir. And now uh, uh, we will hear from Pradeep about the activities which this club has been doing for the past two years. Okay. Good evening, all. <coughs> Hello. Okay. So this is the logo of QE Club. Uh, so this is my mini QE, and this is our ISAN logo. And yes, Curie Club, Aizar Mohadi, it's a common platform for the minds polarized towards chemistry where we all collect together, discuss, know the new chemistry developing these days in more informal manner and in way apart from the boring textbook chemistry by means of many activities. And uh, the club is named after Marie Curie to commemorate Curie's remarkable services to chemical sciences and to mark the birth of club in 2011 and she got the Nobel Prize twice, we all know that. And we have been successfully running our activities for the past two years which includes till now 9 student talks, 13 Iser faculty talks, 6 guest talks, TED talks, movie screening, extreme engineering screening, Nobel quiz, documentary screening, fascinating demonstrations and the movie on Madame Curie and gender quiz etc. And this is the picture which we went for an industrial visit to Panacea Biotech. And here we have Dr. Samnar who took us there. And then uh, Curie Club even had, uh, it celebrates uh, Curie's birthday as can be chemistry week for a week, so in which we conducted many activities like poster presentation and descriptive writing event and uh, the prize distribution ceremony. And the winners and the participants were awarded this wonderful certificate which contains picture of both Mary and uh, Raman, who were both born on the same day, number 7, and uh, Curie Club has its own website, curieclub.dumai.com, or you just go to Google and type Curie Club Aizen Mohani, you will get this website, and yeah, now it's the today's activity. So, Professor Varnam is someone who needs no introduction, but I would like to just say a few words about him. He's one of the best biochemists in the country, something all of us know. Uh, Professor Varnam did his BSc from the Pegasin College in Pune, and uh, after which he did his Masters from IIT Kanpur. He did his PhD in Carnegie Mellon, and which was followed by a postdoc at the Harvard University. Uh, so he was uh, uh, he was a colleague of Professor G. M. Ramachandran at the Molecular Biophysics Unit in the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. So today he'll be talking to us about uh, G. M. Ramachandran's work and its impact on structural biology. So with this, I would like to invite. Lower than the evening lecture, uh, you will bear with me. What I thought I would do when Shweta invited me to come and speak to you is to tell you a little bit about uh, G. N. Ramachandran and his work and the manner in which uh, I am qualified to speak about his work because I was not his student. Now, Ramachandran was probably. I think one of the most important scientists in India post-independence. Uh, so everybody knows the names of the pre-independence uh, heroes of science in India, Ramam, Bose, Saha, and so forth. But in the years after independence, Ramachandran did extraordinary work at Madras University uh, in the early 1950s all the way through till the end of the 1960s. 
the most important pieces of work that he did was the determination of the structure of colleges in the period between 1954 and 1955, and the work that led to the Ramachandran map in the early 1960s, between 1961 and 1965, with the map being effectively complete by about 1963. So the first thing that I would like uh, to tell all the students is I had nothing to do whatsoever with any of the work of Ramachandran that I'm going to describe. I saw Ramachandran many years later when he was already uh, a very, very highly established scientist, a very senior individual, and a man with a formidable reputation. Now, if you open a biochemistry textbook today, uh, any biochemistry textbook, you will in fact find a picture of the Ramachandran map, and I'll tell you what it is uh, all about. So one of the reasons I did prepare this talk some time ago was in the year 2003, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences uh, celebrated a major event. And this event was the 50th anniversary of the recognition by Linus Pauling of uh, the alphabetical structure of proteins and also the other kinds of secondary structures in proteins, left feet sheets. A commentary was written by David Eisenberg, a very prominent crystallographer in the United States, and a PhD student of Pauli, and he wrote this. He said, today the Ramachandran diagram is taught in all classes on protein structure, and is featured in every textbook to give insight into the forces that determine the structures of proteins. But there is nothing in this diagram beyond what Pauli and Corey knew well. They built models of their proposed structures that embodied all the features of the Ramachandran diagram. Apparently, they understood the principles so well, they felt no need to explain them by a diagram of the sort. I thought that this paragraph, which appeared in the Proceedings of the National Academy, maybe two years after Ramachandran had died, had really no place in the scientific literature. And such a paragraph ought not to have been written uh, by David Eisenberg, but nevertheless, he did it. Now, I'll tell you a little bit of history. The little bit of history is on this slide. In 1943, a paper appeared, an article appeared, in uh, Chemical Reviews, written by a man called Morris Huggins. Uh, Morris Huggins is actually credited uh, with what one might call the introduction of the hydrogen bond into the literature of chemistry. If you want to have a citation to when was the hydrogen bond first introduced into chemistry, there is a paper by Latimer and Rosebush which will appear in the Journal of the American Chemical Society. But it turned out that Huggins was in fact a senior undergraduate student uh, at Berkeley and as part of an undergraduate project, and therefore I think it's a very appropriate story to tell Eliza, he uh, uh, wrote a little undergraduate project report on a hydrogen bond. He introduced the term hydrogen bond or the fact that a hydrogen atom uh, between two electronegative atoms could give rise to some kind of stabilizing interaction for the first time in the literature. Uh, there's a footnote in the Latimer Rosebush paper which actually refers uh, to Huggins' uh, uh, report. If you look at the literature and if you look at the history of uh, uh, historical aspects of this literature, you will find some misleading things. At one point, there will be a report which says it was Huggins' master's thesis. In another one, they will say that it was in fact an assignment that he turned in for an undergraduate course in chemistry. But that's how the hydrogen bond really had its origins. But in 1943, when people were thinking about uh, the structures of proteins, uh, Pauling's laboratory already had determined some crystal structures of amino acids. And Pauling had already recognized the importance of the hydrogen bond. So had Huggins. And this remarkable review, which appeared in 1943, uh, several years before the Pauling helix, actually has the helical structures of proteins as, you, as we really think about them today. There are hydrogen bonds between uh, acceptor CO groups and donor NH groups along the backbone of a polypeptide chain. 
And then in 1950, this paper appeared. This is another interesting paper. I'm very fond of this paper because I show it whenever I have a chance, uh, so that I hope that someone will come up with another example. Uh, this is the only example that I know of a paper in the literature in which there are three authors, all of whom won the Nobel Prize. Uh, Bragg had already won the Nobel Prize. Uh, Perus and Kendu would win it about a dozen years after this paper was published. But why have I put this paper up? This also shows you hydrogen bonded structures in polypeptides. It shows you a helix. But the wonderful thing about this paper is every single structure in this paper is wrong. And uh, this was in 1950, just before our Pauling actually got the correct structure for the alpha helix. One of the problems with this paper was, at the time that this paper was written, uh, Bragg, Kendrew, and Perutz uh, did not, although they knew this, they did not use uh, amide bonds or peptide bonds as planar entities. Uh, they didn't use them as planar entities. Therefore, they built models in which they allowed twist about these, and they could then form all kinds of hydrogen bonds, uh, which really do not occur uh, in proteins. But nevertheless, the paper is rather nice. I also tell you that people who will win Nobel Prizes and people who have won Nobel Prizes are not infallible, and uh, that they can, in fact, make uh, very large numbers of mistakes. Very often, Unlike ordinary people, they probably make more mistakes because they're no longer afraid of making mistakes. That's Pauling in 1967 at Madras University when uh, he came for the second of the international symposia that Ramachandran organized in Madras. That's Pauling with the model of the Alpha Helix. Uh, this model of the Alpha Helix he brought with him and presented it to Ramachandran at that time. So this is available at Madras University. But subsequently, both in the Madras department and in my own department where I joined as a lecturer uh, in the early 1970s, uh, many such models were actually fabricated uh, uh, in the workshop. Now I'll go back to what Ra the Ramachandran map is all about. The Ramachandran map really is an unreal it attempts to explain what are all the possible states that a polypeptide chain can actually take. Uh, even though it's a very long chain and can fold in three-dimensional space uh, into all kinds of shapes. The major simplification uh, uh, in introducing the Ramachandran map was to consider each residue as a point at which a tetrahedral carbon atom was in fact connected to two planar uh, peptide units. Therefore, you had two planes which were in fact connected by a tetrahedral hinge, and therefore you could rotate these two planes about the tetrahedral hinge. And Ramachandran then realized that you could use very conveniently a geometrical parameter, which is the dihedral angle. So if you have just two atoms and they are joined to one another, you have only a single distance between them, which is the bond length. If you have uh, three atoms connected to one another, then you have these two lengths and an angle. But if you have a fourth atom, then of course the fourth atom can be here, it can be there, and if you have rotation about a single bond, you then end up with all the states which are now conventionally called conformations. So if you have a state like this, then the dihedral angle is 90 degrees. If you have a state like this, the dihedral angle is 0 degrees. If you have a state like this, the dihedral angle is 1. And chemists already knew, for instance, when you study a basic chemistry course, you learn about Newman projections for ethane, the Newman projection diagram for butane, for instance. And if you take something like butane, uh, you, the three eclipse conformations of butane are all not equivalent. The two gauche forms of butane are different from the trans form of butane. And there is a value to rotation about the single bond, which is a rather small barrier, so everything can interconvert. Now, of course, if you have three conformations, about one single bond, then if you take a polypeptide chain, you will have, in fact, two bonds about which rotations are, in fact, possible. Bond there by and a bond there side. And uh, in principle, at least at a first approximation, you can say, well, look, I can have uh, three states about one bond and three states about another bond. 
which would be in three square states or nine states for a given amino acid residue. But in a protein which is a polymer, the same thing repeats over and over again. Tetrahedral carbon, Mi bond, tetrahedral carbon, Mi bond, and so forth. And if I now approximate 9 as 10, it would mean that I would have 10 conformational states maybe at a single residue. And if I had a 100 residue chain, I would have 10 raised to 100 conformations. And if I had 10 raised to 100 conformations, that is a number which I can't anymore think about. It's a very, very large number. Now, of course, Professor Dati Murthy is here, and you might ask the question, how quickly can I go from one conformation to the other? Uh, the fastest time that you might think of, uh, uh, if you stretched it a little bit, uh, uh, you might say, well, maybe 10 raised to minus 13 seconds, maybe the fastest time you can go from one state to the other. Even if you use a number like that, you would find that if proteins were to carry out an exhaustive conformational search, to find a, a minimum, it will take them longer than the lifetime of the universe. Therefore, proteins don't do exhaustive conformational searches because they fold so quickly in biochemistry. As soon as they come off the ribosome, uh, they have folded. A very simple experiment which shows this is that if you induce the beta calcitonase gene and uh, add IPTG and induce this thing and it produces the, produce the enzyme, if you have a substrate which turns blue when the the colonies will turn blue immediately. Therefore, protein folding happens very really quickly. This is what is called in the protein folding literature as the lemon color paradox. Uh, how do proteins fold so quickly when they have such a large conformational space? But the question that I might ask is, do they really have such a large conformational space, or is conformational space more limited? And that's the question which really Ramachandra addressed when he introduced the Ramachandra map, because what the Ramachandra map really delineates are islands of allowed structures. Uh, Ramachandra said some structures are allowed, some other structures are not allowed. How did he do this? All he did was, he said that atoms have a finite size, and if there are conformations in which two atoms come closer than the sum of their radii, they can't do that because two or solid objects cannot occupy the same space at the same time. Therefore, all conformations in which atoms come closer than the sum of their Vandervaal's radii are now disallowed, and only those which are further apart are in fact allowed. And that is how he drew the contours of the Ramachandra map. So, what the Ramachandra map does is, it defines these allowed regions in uh, two-dimensional phi-size space for each recipe. But even more importantly, it introduces a very key idea, I think, in thinking about molecules. If you want to think in three dimensions, one way is to reduce the three-dimensional problem to two dimensions. In principle, if you want to, to think about uh, a multi-dimensional uh, space, you'd like to reduce it to something that you can think about. And most of us are comfortable thinking in two dimensions. Along the two axes, we are plotting a three-dimensional parameter. I will digress at this point. I should have put the slide in, but I did not. Uh, someone asked me when, uh, in the evening, uh, what kind of lecture did you give at IIT Roper? Now, at IIT Roper, I did not give a lecture which had anything to do with science, but I spoke about institutions. And therefore, I will spend a second uh, digressing from the Ramachandran map. But I used exactly a figure like the Ramachandran map. Because there is one in thinking about size, uh, which is called uh, the Stokes diagram, or which appeared in a book called Pasteur's Quadrant, which uses exactly a divide space that you're thinking about into zones and asks the question how will you go from one zone to another, which is equivalent to asking how will a protein go from an alphabetical structure to a beta sheet structure or to some other structure. I can put anything on the axis. Uh, Stokes actually put applied science along this axis and basic science along that axis and said that top right quadrant, which is both applied and hugely basic, is what is called Pasteur's quadrant. And uh, he was a political scientist thinking about science. And Pasteur's quadrant, of course, is the quadrant in which the best of research is done. Pasteur is the founding father of microbiology. He introduced vaccines into the literature, but he's also the founding father 
of organic stereochemistry because he's the man who first recognized uh, that uh, uh, the problem of chirality in molecules and the ability of molecules to rotate in plane of polarized light. He gave a very famous lecture in the 1850s to the French Academy of Sciences where he did this, he described the spontaneous resolution of tartaric acid and the fact that uh, one form of tartaric acid rotated the plane of polarized light to the left, the other form of tartaric acid. And he, at that time, thought about the structures of molecules. So you can use this kind of diagram for almost anything. Uh, if you're thinking, for example, uh, about the institutions, you can say there are the best institutions, and how would you get there if you started over here? And then you have to find a way through this space. Now, of course, if you ask most people, and Professor Tatyamukhi will agree with me, I might have walked along this axis administrative flexibility, and along the other access financial resources. So people usually think that if they have unlimited money and unlimited freedom, they will do very good work. The fact of the matter is, uh, it never happened uh, uh, that way. So it is very useful to think in two-dimensional space, whatever problem you're thinking about. But where did Ramachandran get the idea for the Ramachandran map? It starts really with the structure of colors. This is the collagen triple helix, which was deduced by Ramachandran and Kaka in the early 1950s at Madras. The diffraction data that they had looked like this. So you can see if there are a few spots, this means that if you have a fiber and you pass X-rays through it, if you have an oriented fiber, you will see some reflections, which will tell you something about the regularity in the spacing of the atoms around the fiber. There's not much more. Uh, uh, experimental information here. Watson and Crick used exactly the same kind of picture to get the double helix. So now if you look at, uh, if you read Watson's book, The Double Helix, uh, you will find uh, uh, how it is that they go from minimal data to model building. Now Ramachandran also resorted to model building in order to explain the fiber diffraction pattern and a little bit of other information which is available about culture. What is culture? Collagen is the most abundant mammalian protein. It's a large fibrous protein. It's the major component of tendon, bone, cartilage, teeth, etc. The most interesting thing about collagen is that it has a very unusual amino acid composition. And since we know that proteins are polymers of amino acids, you can look at proteins as heteropolymers. They are heteropolymers which have uh, 20 building blocks simply distributed uh, along the sequence. Collagen is a somewhat less heterogeneous polymer than the globular proteins, in that there are only three kinds of amino acids which are repeated uh, along the collagen chain. It turns out that one of them is glycine, and then there is proline and hydroxychloroquine again. But glycine is the smallest of the amino acids. And glycine is in the first position, in the fourth position, in the seventh position, so it has this periodic repetition along the sequence. Collagen is also a fiber with a certain tensile strength. It has wonderful mechanical properties, and therefore, there must be something in the structure of collagen which explains all of this. So there is one clue. One third of collagen is the smallest amino acid glycine. Ramachandran then came up with the triple helix. Now, if you want to see uh, a model of the triple helix as Ramachandran did, you should go to the Central Leather Research Institute in uh, Chennai, which is just next to the department where he worked in the 1950s and 60s, and you will find this at the entrance to their auditorium. Their auditorium is called the Triple Helix Auditorium, so just like you have Isla Mohali, which you can see from the road, uh, you'll find the Triple Helix uh, lit up when you look at the road in area, you will find, you can read the Triple Helix from outside. Um, because it's very important to leather. This is a view, as drawn by Ramachandran, of a view of the triple helix. It's a projection diagram uh, down the axis. What did he have? He had three chains now, which were now wound around one another. They went round and round one another. Why did he have three chains? He had three chains because one third of the amino acids was actually glycine. Therefore, when you have the three chains, only the smallest amino acid can actually fit in the middle. And therefore, he introduced a model in which you require glycine uh, 
in that kind of repetitive uh, pattern and came up with this wonderful picture of culture. This explained the X-ray data. And uh, when I heard him tell the story uh, many, many years ago, uh, what he used to say is that he got this idea of the triple helix uh, when one day he saw, when he was, he was obviously thinking about the problem all the time, he saw his wife uh, plaking her hair. And uh, the traditional uh, uh, chameleon uh, ladies who in fact take their hair rather tightly are round and round it would go. And then when you see this kind of coiling, you get the idea that maybe the fiber is also coiling in the same fashion. This is the model that you will actually find at CLRI when you go there. Now, let's look at the dates a little bit. Now, the and structural collagen actually appeared first in Nature in 1954, uh, uh, again in 55, and again in 56. So this was the first paper to appear on collagen, uh, producing the triple helix of collagen in 1954. I say 1954 more than once, simply because if you think about this, 1953 was the year in which Watson and Crick published the structure of the double helix. And 1951 to 53 was the, was the time in which Pauling published the helical structures of protein, the first paper appearing in 1951. Ramachandran had read the paper by Pauling, but he had certainly not read the paper by Watson and Crick, because in those days, Nature would not have appeared in, uh, uh, in Madras uh, very quickly after publication because all journals used to come by, uh, by sea, so they would appear several months later. So unless someone wrote a letter to you, you wouldn't. I never did have the chance to ask him whether he had seen the uh, Watson and Crick paper. He was a formidable man and uh, therefore it would have been a very difficult question to, uh, to ask him at any point because he went to what happened to me, even though it was many, many years after this had happened. Therefore, he really didn't think of it all by himself. And in many ways, if you look at a technical solution to the limited X-ray diffraction data that was available, collagen was a much more difficult problem than the alpha helix or the DNA double helix. It was technically a more difficult problem. But immediately after this appeared, uh, Francis Craig, and uh, Alexander Rich wrote a paper in Nature in 1955 criticizing the Ramachandran structure of collagen. They also had a triple helix, but they said that the Ramachandran triple helix is wrong uh, because it now has unfavorable steric contacts between atoms. And uh, as uh, one might expect, when criticism came from Cambridge at that time, everybody bought that criticism. And uh, both in India as well as abroad. Uh, so everyone dismissed the Ramachandran structure. Uh, I mean, after all, if Francis Crick has now said that the structure is wrong, it must be wrong. And uh, the Ramachandran at that time was extraordinarily upset by this and uh, went on to ask the question if a model is being dismissed on steric grounds, how do you change it? Because nobody knows what. The Van der Waals radii of uh, atoms, where nobody knows what the Van der Waals contact distances between atoms were. And uh, certainly Craig did not know. Uh, he simply pulled it out of his hat. And uh, it was this criticism by Craig on the structure of collagen which drove Ramachandran to asking this question how close can atoms come together in these biological structures? What are the allowed contact distances? and what are uh, distances which one can definitely say are disallowed. And the only way to do this was to go back to the experimental data which was available, which are the few crystal structures which